it seems totally normal to listen to a podcast about the Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos podcast. My name is Ben Grant. I'm joined as always by JB. This is the last podcast before training camp gets underway. We've been waiting for it feels like decades to say that. So this feels like a pretty big week. And just like the last several weeks, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. We've got uh, a bunch of roster transactions that uh, we'll go through in just a few moments. We're also going to talk about our most anticipated camp battles. JB's got one picked out and I've got one picked out. We'll, we'll see what we've come up with. And now that betting on the CFL is legal in Canada, individual sports betting, we're going to talk about some of the best bets that we found out there for this coming season. Just in case you were looking for another way to throw your money away, JB and I have you covered. And of course, TFC and the Blue Jays are starting to talk about returning home. You've probably seen that in the news. We'll give you what we know and how that impacts the Argos. Before we get going, this morning we learned about the passing of Edmonton Elks and CFL superfan Brian Edwards. And I wanted to take a minute to, to talk about Brian Edwards. He was everything that a fan is supposed to be and more. He was enthusiastic. He knew everything there was to know about the league and he was highly positive, uh, which isn't always the case for every fan across every fan base. He engaged with fans of every team in the CFL on social media. If you are on social media and love talking CFL, there's no chance that you didn't run into him at some point. Uh, he was always engaging in a fun, intelligent, and very politely Canadian way. And if you're wondering about the impact that he had, there's already been an outpouring of social media posts from dozens of CFL players, including BC Lions quarterback Michael Riley, who uh, of course spent several years in Edmonton. And I'm sure that's just going to continue as, as the day goes on uh, and throughout the week as well. So our, our condolences to his family and friends. Brian Edwards was the perfect CFL fan and he'll be missed. All right, let's get to our Toronto Argonauts transactions. Signings first. A few Canadians were brought in. I want to talk about uh, each of them just a little bit. So we've got uh, Eric Mezzalira, who is a linebacker, 6 feet, 225, 27 years old. I think before I give you anything else, as much as some of these roster battles are going to be really tough, I don't think Eric Mezzalira is a camp body. I think he is such a gifted special teams player that he's going to take up a roster spot which is going to make this battle at linebacker even more highly contested. And if you want to throw the defensive lineman in there too, because I know sometimes there is uh, a bit of an interchangeable element, um, this is only going to increase uh, the, the tension in that battle at linebacker. So Mezzalira most recently was playing for the Calgary Stampeders. He went to McMaster where he played that, in that max spot. Um, he's fairly local uh, from Cardinal Newman, and he played on pretty much every special teams unit in Calgary over the 2018 and 2019 season. He was playing the left tackle and left guard spot on the punt team. Uh, he was playing the center spot and kickoff return. They uh, had him uh, essentially lined up as an end on punt return and on kickoff team. He was usually one of the interior guys, usually lined up as the number four, number five. And he's just all over the field. He's got a ton of special teams highlights. He's the kind of guy that could just take it somehow. Uh, he was so gifted at absorbing contact. And so that's why he was in such a, a range of, of different positions. And you can trust him as an up back. He's great on the outside. He hustles like nobody else down the field. And I think that work ethic is why he was brought in. And when you look up and down this roster, there aren't a ton of special teams aces. Uh, he's one of them. 2019 didn't go quite as well for him as 2018. He did suffer some injuries. He actually got hurt uh, in a game against the Argonauts, had a kind of nasty ankle injury, and just didn't really look the same after that. But he's an impact player on specials. So if he's healthy, and I have no reason to believe he's not, I think he's on that roster for his special teams ability alone. And then the question becomes, who's off it? JB, the value of special teams players, how do you even begin to factor that in when we look at this roster? 
Well, I think it's 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 definitely a great sign that they are looking to to flesh out special teams. I think that means you have a re- you, it means you're really happy with your roster because now you're you're adding some some depth pieces because you have uh you know, you have a strong structure to build from. So I was happy to see that and I love it. I think um it's becoming more the norm that instead of special teams just being kind of leftover starters that there are you know that special teams is a skill and that you you should go looking for guys who excel at special teams and not just have you know your your seventh wide receiver playing out there who isn't necessarily going to be a good special teamer uh you know he just happens to be one by default so i love I love the strategy to go get guys who are going to go out there and make that uh, make that uh, group elite. The Argos also signed Quinn Smith, defensive tackle slash offensive lineman uh, out of Concordia. He played the last five seasons in Calgary. He's got a really interesting story to him. So he's 6'2", 300 pounds, 29 years old now. He is probably the only team MVP uh, that was a tackle and offensive lineman uh, in in university for Concordia. He won the the team MVP award, which I think is just amazing, and it tells you the impact he had playing both ways on that squad at defensive tackle and guard. And what's kind of funny is that he ended up using these skills when he got to Calgary. So in 2015, the Stampeders playing the Argonauts. And the Stamps go through all sorts of injury issues. I think they had three offensive linemen down and they were just out. So the next guy goes down and in comes Quinn Smith, who had been uh, playing some spot duty at defensive tackle. Suddenly now he's playing guard on the other side of the ball. Calgary goes on to win that game, which just seems so Toronto in some ways. 25-20 was the final. And Quinn Smith ends up with the offensive game ball even though he was uh, listed as a defensive tackle and had only ever played defensive tackle in the CFL. So he's a pretty interesting guy. And what makes it even more interesting is I noticed on the Argonauts website, they've listed him exclusively as an offensive lineman. So I think that tells you a couple of things. I think it tells you, first of all, that this is not necessarily a camp body that you're just bringing in. I think if he was listed on the D line, I, you know, I don't think if that was his only position, I don't think there was any way uh, he could, he could see himself through to making this team. But as an offensive lineman, if that's where they're putting him, you know, maybe, maybe there's some room there. And clearly you like the versatility of a guy like this and someone that's just a team player and, and so committed uh, to, to winning football games, I think is a pretty cool ad. The next guy I want to talk about that the Argonauts added, Liam O'Brien, fullback uh, out of St. Mary's, 6'3", 235, 25 years old. JB, this is this is your guy. I don't know if you remember last year on our draft preview podcast, April 2020, uh, Liam O'Brien was one of those sleeper picks that you were looking for in the later rounds. Uh, what was it you liked about Liam O'Brien? Well, I mean, I guess p- partially I was, I was, uh, you know, b- being from St. Mary's, I liked the fact that he went to St. Mary's. Um, but I, what I really liked is I, I love the use of a fullback. I think that that fullbacks are underused. Um, I know it, p- people sort of laugh when you talk about fullbacks in the Canadian game, but I, I still think there is a place for fullback play in Canadian football. And, uh, you know, I thought that he, he looked the part and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I would love to see them incorporate him. And then I think he'll also be a special teams monster. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. He was, I think you and I both had him as the best fullback in the draft last year. He went undrafted. I don't think he played anywhere last year. And so the Argos were able to pick him up. And I, like you say, I think he's going to be just a special team stud. He's got such an interesting story, too. He went to St. Mary's to play quarterback. So I think, I think how his story began, he's a BC guy. And he ended up going to Simon Fraser. And he wanted to play quarterback there, but they were trying to switch him to the other side of the ball, I think. Uh, or maybe they were trying to switch him to tight end. I can't remember. One of the two. Uh, you know, he's a pretty big guy. He's super athletic. So he went to St. Mary's because he really wanted to play QB, actually got some action at QB at St. Mary's, ended up going 21 uh, of 31 for 263 yards, some really nice numbers. 
but decided after that that he was indeed best playing somewhere else. And so they converted him to a tight end sort of H-back slash fullback role. And if he's used in on offense for the Argonauts, I think it'll be in that in that sort of H-back type role. But yeah, I expect him to be a special teams contributor. So yeah, he could be a, another guy that's going to provide for an interesting training camp battle. All right, let's get to our training camp battles, JB. Speaking of, which position are you most excited about? And you could go absolutely anywhere here because I think there are going to be some great competitions all the way across the board except for long snapper. I think everywhere else has a pretty good uh, fight that we're ready for. Which positional group do you like the most here? Well, when when looking at the groups and where the toughest competition is going to be, um, defensive line jumped out at me. Uh, the, you know, if all of these guys come to camp, defensive line is stacked. Stacked. There, there are at least four guys who are going to end up playing for another team because um, they're not going to be able to carry 12 defensive linemen. So uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by, by who comes and, and who's ready to go because it is an incredibly competitive position. And it's so difficult because you can really only keep like I guess it like at absolute most eight I know there are some rare games where teams will actually dress nine but that's when you're counting on several of them to be special teams contributors and that's really not what most of these guys are you look through this this group that we've got of 20 plus defensive linemen and there really aren't a lot of special teams aces on here. So I, I don't know exactly how this is going to work out. Like, how do you keep seven? I don't know. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, when I look at it, you know, I have, you know, probably six who I think are locked. I know, I know. And, 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 and that doesn't even get into all the, the NFL camp guys that they're bringing in. Like, I think if you look at, you know, if you look at Chempong, who's you know they just drafted him, and he's Canadian, and Foot, I think is 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 pretty solid, and then I think Drake Nevis is 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 a definite is you know a, a run stuffer who's gonna who's gonna get in there, and Hughes, that's four. I think Law is a lot. And don't forget about Odell Willis. Well, I I have him on my maybe list, but he, and he might be. That's how bananas this position is. Because, you know, like, I mean, just, Justin Thomas is returning. You know, are they going to cut him? I mean, he's a returning guy. And, and then you're already at seven. <laughs> you know, and then you still haven't talked about Dwayne Hendricks or Eli Howard. Um, you know, Kyrie Thornton. Uh, Sean Oakman. Uh, Sean Oakman. Shane Ray. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, they when you look at it, there's a lot of strength up the middle, um, you know, which is great. I think that that's, you know, that's fantastic. I mean, maybe, you know, Shane Ray gets a look as a pure pass rusher. They don't have a ton of pure pass rushers. But, you know, a lot of these guys that they brought up, you know, it, it depends how plugged in they are. But, you know, these guys who jumped around from or moved from sort of practice squad to practice squad, they're still young. You know, 23, 24, 25. I mean, if you hit on one of those guys, you, you've got a guy for five years. You know, that's where, like, if, you know, I look at Adele Willis and, like, he's 36. Like, are you going to keep him and Hughes? I mean, I know he's awesome and he's going to come in there and he's just going to guile the hell out of these young kids coming up from America. I don't know. I mean, you you know, like you're looking at one year probably of Odell Willis. It's crazy that you could put a defensive line together of former NFL players and have none of those four guys make the team. Like it's it's possible we end up in a scenario where there's no Shane Ray, uh, Eli Harold, Kyrie Thornton, Coney Ely. I think Coney Ely and Shane Ray both have tough camp battles. Yeah. They're older than the other guys that they brought in. Uh, they don't have any CFL experience. Um, I think it's I think it's going to be a, you know that those guys are going to need to pop. And a guy that we haven't mentioned, one of our recent signings, Eli Howard, 
who I think, and I think he might be better than than half of these guys. We haven't even talked about him yet either. So I, I, I mean, I was, you know, looking at some of his film, and I mean, uh, one one scout called him the most likable guy in the twenty twenty draft. That's pretty high praise. You know, I I agree. I I think that he's going to come in here and work, and he's twenty four. You know, when I look at my maybes, uh, my maybe list is stacked. You know, Ronald Ollie, uh, uh, Ricky Neal. You, you know, these guys are great football players. You know, I, I, like I said, Odell Willis, he's going to be tough to keep off the roster because he's going to look better than everybody. Because he's going to go out there and he's got a he's a veteran and he's going to look the part. Is this a good situation or a bad situation for Coach Davis? Like looking at his his line when he gets out there, like it, it's Oof. great. Like you get so excited when there's this much talent. But I don't envy some of these decisions he's going to make because he knows that whoever he cuts is going to be staffing other teams, right? You're going to let go, like you said, of a few guys that end up going against you. And you're like, who do who do I not want to see on the other side of the ball in a few weeks' time? That makes it even more difficult. I see 11 defensive linemen I would like to keep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's some flexibility. You know, there is the the one and six game injured list. You know, there are there is the suspension list. There is a practice squad. But uh, you just, I, I, I don't know how you just choose seven names and say, yeah, we're dra- dressing these seven guys. Without- I mean, you know what it'll come down to? It'll come down to who stayed in shape uh, and who is up here not as a last chance at romance but is up here to be a professional football player and that'll that'll decide it really quick i mean with 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 the competition in this camp the guys who have stayed football sharp and ready um are going to be good to go and anybody who has not is immediately going to get teared off so i think that uh, it'll it'll be very interesting in camp because there's not going to be any building to getting on the team there's too much competition yeah you know I, I would say that the decisions on this group have, were already made six months ago by the individuals, you know, depending on who is in football shape and who is not. I think a lot of this decision making is going to come down to who they feel they can keep on the practice squad, too. I think if they feel like they can keep Sam Chang on the practice squad, uh, you know, maybe Robbie Smith, they would love to keep those Canadians around. And if they feel like they don't have a place for them, then they need to keep them on the team in, in in some way or other you can't lose a guy like a champong and so yeah i i don't know but i think if everyone shows up in peak condition then to me i think that's going to end up being charleston hughes drake nevis fabian foot i think odell willis cordero law oh that's five and then i i guess if it's peak condition shane ray Kyrie thornton Maybe it's those those last two. I, I I don't I don't see them cutting Justin Thomas. He's a returner, I think, and he was good for them. Like he wasn't an all star, but he was a rock solid returner. I agree, and I, I like Justin Thomas a lot, but I, I but he's not their guy, right? They, there's a difference in that he they didn't bring him in. But the other side of that is they did keep him though. So you know they didn't keep a lot of guys. They kept like five guys, and he's one of them. So they clearly like him. Yeah. I think he's. I think he's. I think he's pretty close to a lock. Interesting. Well, I can't wait to see how that camp battle unfolds. Let's move on to my pick for most interesting positional group. For me, it's wide receivers, and similar to what you were saying, I think guys that are cut from this squad are going to be starting on other teams. There's just too much talent, and much like with the conversation on the defensive side of the ball the kind of shape everyone arrives in is going to help dictate who goes where. So to start off with, I, I think locks to make the team, Deveris Daniels, without question, Eric Rogers, Juwan Breskison, Dejan Brissett, those guys are absolute locks. I don't think I don't think there's any chance that any of those four guys don't make it. And like defensive line, we're really talking about seven guys dressed on game day. You can find a way to make eight, but it's tough. And again, you're relying heavily on special teams contributions. There are at least a few guys who can do that on this unit, especially in the return game. Now, for the remaining players, I I think probably Ricky Collins Jr., if he's kept in shape, you know, he's a recent signing. He's obviously had that itch and wanted to play. I feel pretty strongly that Diverse Daniels reached out to him and and said, you know, hey, you got to get up here. Well, you know, we 
we can always use an, a, an extra skilled receiver like yourself. And because they played next to each other in Edmonton. And so I, I see him as a pretty likely candidate to make it, make the team as long as he's been able to stay in shape. And after that, I, I can't see, I can't see Sinkfield uh, not making this team. And that already, I think, brings us to six. Who's the seventh at that point? We haven't even talked about Martavis Bryant. We haven't talked about Kendall Wright, these two NFL stars. We haven't talked about Chandler Worthy, who might be the fastest guy in this entire group. And then you've got a couple of uh, really great potential returners in Braverman, Rucker. Man, this is a rough, rough positional battle. And I'm starting to think more and more the likelihood of us seeing Martavis Bryant and Kendall Wright on the field for this team is is seems to be taking a hit for me every day. It, uh, it's going to be hard to have both those guys who don't have CFL experience. It, it, I mean, the reality is it's hard, even, even if you're an NFL guy, it is so hard to come up and beat out a CFL guy at the CFL game. You know, the, just the, the technique and the understanding, um, it's just it's just an uphill battle because the pure athleticism is not enough. You know, I mean, it's like when the American coaches come up, they just they just can't do it. They can't beat a CFL coach. Um, so I, I think it's going to be hard for those guys to to adjust when there is so much competition. I uh, you know I really I really agree with you unless their you know their skill is so you know, uh, off the charts that you just have to keep them. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to, I think they're going to have a really hard time beating, beating those vets out of, out of a position. I think the first time you and I are able to get down to Guelph and see not only who's there, but what they look like and what kind of shape everyone's in, I think is going to make both of these pictures a lot more clear because we'll, we'll be able to tell right away, you know, who's, who's there for real and who just simply wasn't ready. And I think that it's going to make this a lot less murky than it seems right now. It's a coach's dream. I mean, to be honest, I think it, it's going to challenge the coaching staff because they're going to have to make decisions really quickly because because of the length of camp and no preseason. But to to have that level of depth, you're you're immediately going to see you know, where you might look at a guy and say like, maybe, but now you don't have to worry about maybe. Basically, you're just going to have to pick the guys who are ready to go, who are dialed in, who want to be coached. Um, so even though we've talked a lot about how this might be a challenging team for for a, a new coaching staff, I do think that's a fantastic position to be in at these two uh, units that the guys are going to have to be dialed in and ready to go, or they're just going to be gone. And I think my final comment on this would be the seven that we see dressed for week one are, and I'm going to kind of cop out a little bit on this one too, but I think it's going to be Daniels, Rogers, Sinkfeld, Breskison, Brissett, and then, oh, and uh, Collins Jr. And then one of either Kendall Wright and Martavis Bryant. So that'll be your seven that we have addressed. But then again, I look at some of these names I'm missing and I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. And I don't, and I don't have, I don't even know. I guess Singfu can can do some re- returning and so can Brissette. But I'm missing my my two favorite returners in that group in, in Braverman and Rucker. So I don't know. It's a mess. This is a mess. And that's what's so exciting about it. What a great position to be in. Because there have been some years where we're having the opposite discussion. Where we're like, oh, I don't know if I see anyone in this group. And here we've got... You know, you can field two entire teams that would beat the Red Blacks out of this group. So that's pretty exciting. So now that single game betting is legal in Canada and you've got sports books trying to figure out what to do with CFL odds and prop bets and all sorts, a bunch of different websites have come out with some early wagers you can play. So we thought it'd be kind of fun to see what uh, value we could find in Argos related bets. So it seems to me that most of the available prop bets are coming out of Bodog. You can find a, a, a bet on Grey Cup Champ on a few other sites, including Bet365. I saw some odds there. But we're not affiliated with any of the, these sites, and we're not 
condoning or encouraging uh, gambling. Uh, this is your decision. If you want to go off on, on your own and make a call on that, by all means do so. Um, it's, it's a fun thing to do sometimes, but as always, be responsible. Uh, use your best judgment with it. And we're just kind of going through these for fun more than anything else. So I wouldn't take too much of what we say seriously. And uh, I certainly wouldn't invest uh, a lot of your hard-earned money on anything we say. But that said, let's go through some of what we found as the best bets for the Argos. What stood out to you, JB, when you started looking through some of the available prop bets that that uh, Bodog had? Uh, I love the Argos over six and a half. That's the best bet I saw of all CFL bets right now. And they actually, I, I think there were a couple early on of Grey Cup bets for the Argos to win that were actually uh, placed at plus 1,000 or 10 to 1, which I think that was an amazing value. That's come down a little bit. So I now think the best bet you can find out there for the Argos is that over 6.5. And, and it's also got less juice on it right now. Uh, as I look right now on, on Bodog, for over six and a half, uh, you're you're at minus one ten, so you're just ten percent juice, which for prop bets is a little bit under. Uh, the typical line for every other prop bet is is minus one fifteen, so it means money's coming in on the on the under, uh, and uh, so there's <laughs> there's some value there, and I, I think that's probably inspired by the difficult schedule. I totally get oh. why money's coming in on the under, but like we went through last week, we we both feel the Argos are going to come in with nine wins. And so even if we're off on a couple of games and they don't manage to squeak out one of those that we had penciled in as a loss, uh, you're still looking at a win. So I love that bet. That's my favorite of all of the available bets on the Argos. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. I, I actually love Kudera Law leading the league in sacks. That's an interesting one too. And I could I could see that happening. His his value isn't bad. So Cordero Law's at plus 650. That's not bad. And and it's a yep. hard thing to find great value in some of these individual player prop bets. So like Charleston Hughes in that same bet is is plus 180, which is you just should never make that bet. And even if you think Charleston Hughes is going to lead the league in sacks, there's just not enough value even on the team. Like even if you're saying which Argonaut would be the team leader in sacks, plus 180 is not great odds. And so when you have to now include the entire league, uh, including guys like Willie Jefferson and and uh, and some of those other guys out there, it's just not worth your money. But yeah, Cordero Law is very good value at plus 650, I think. But it's a, it's a risky play. You're talking about so many possibilities, not just within the Argonauts to lead the league in sacks, but across the entire league. And then the, the problem the Argos have is they may spread the wealth a little bit. They, that may dilute some of the production that you see from guys like, like Hughes and, and Law and you know some of those other rushers. Yeah, like I think I'd be curious to see what offenses do. Like my, my, my guess is, you know, our team's going to block up Hughes and therefore leaving Law with, with uh, less double teaming. The other good value that I saw out there was Alden Darby leading the league in interceptions. He's at plus 750, which yeah. I do think is, again, decent value for him. He's a ball hawk. He loves going after that football. There's nothing that makes him happier than, than picking off the football. And he's always looking to make a play. But the problem is we still don't know for sure that he's going to be at free. And I think that's where he needs to be if he's going to lead the league in picks because that's where he does the his most sneaky work uh, where he gambles and and finds himself in places the QB wasn't expecting so if he ends up at, at boundary corner or something like that I, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to happen I think he will shut down guys but I don't think he's going to end up leading the league in, in picks what did you make of Bodog having uh McLeod uh, Bethel Thompson on the board for uh leading in uh, CFL passing yards. I know. They don't even have Arbuckle as an option. That's crazy. You've got nine options for CFL season passing yards leader. And Matt, Matt Nichols is, is on there for Ottawa, but no Nick Arbuckle for Toronto. It doesn't make any sense. Like you can't even bet on Arbuckle to lead the league in passing yards, but you can bet on McLeod Bethel Thompson, who we kind of all view as the second string quarterback. What does this say? Like, I'll, I'll tell you what my version is, and then you can tell me what you think you read into this. To me, I feel like this is... Uh, this, uh, there's, to me, there's no chance Bodog doesn't know what they're doing. These 
these gambling websites and anyone with Vegas ties at all, these guys aren't idiots. They know exactly what they're doing. They're very good at making money. There's no chance that they don't even know who the starting quarterback is. So then you say, well, why would they put that down then? And either this is just an attempt to take people's money uh, or they just don't know what to do with a guy like Arbuckle. They don't have enough data to be able to reliably put a number out there that they feel comfortable with. And so instead they go with McLeod Bethel Thompson, just basically hoping to take your money. That's that's my guess as to what's happened here. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, they have Martavis Bryant down as a wide receiving threat. Um, I, you know, I agree with you. I think you would, you you definitely wouldn't suspect that Bodog wouldn't be on top of it. But it it's it certainly feels like they're going off old information. Uh, you know, I I don't understand how Matt Nichols can get on the board and Arbuckle can't, um, you know, unless they they've got inside information on who's going to win the camp battle. I, and I just can't see that being the case either. Like if McLeod Bethel Thompson wins the camp battle, I I will be stunned. And you and I have have followed this as closely as anybody. And I just can't see any way that that. We don't have Nick Arbuckle starting the season at quarterback. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of that. And it's and I don't think those are even very good odds uh, at 700 plus 700 for a guy that you're looking at. Like if you're if, if that was at at plus 3000. Now we're talking now that's interesting because you say, well, yeah, what if, you know, if Arbuckle gets hurt, you could see uh, Macbeth coming in and, and airing it out. And maybe that's worth the gamble. But at plus 700. At bet, it's basically the same odds that you've got on on Trevor Harris, which is a, a much better bet in that case. Trevor Harris was the absolute steal bet in this category. He opened at plus one thousand. He's now down to plus six hundred, but that's still a decent value. But to know, do not bet on McLeod Bethel Thompson at plus seven hundred. That is not a good bet. Any others that you wanted to highlight here, JB? I just think some of the odds just don't make it worth going after it's cool that you've got two argos as potentials for the cfl most outstanding canadian but enoch muamba at plus 150 i would not take a shot on and cameron judge at plus 160 again i I don't think those are even good odds to say best argonaut defender no i i think it speaks to i do think it speaks to um, Bodog not being entirely sure about what they want to do here, and hedging their hedging their bets as opposed to offering juicy odds to get action flowing. Um, it does feel like we're not totally sure what this league is all about, and we're going to offer you some conservative odds until we figure out what the heck is going on. The last thing we got to talk about today is the exciting news that we may be close to both TFC and the Blue Jays returning home, which I think is exciting because I think that only leads to better things to come for the Toronto Argonauts. I I feel like if TFC and the Jays are allowed to return home, I feel like the protocols that are currently in place for CFL players may adjust because I don't think they're going to make the Blue Jays and the TFC players adhere to those exact same protocols. I think there's going to be, again, this this big outcry. And I think that will only help the causes of the CFL players who really are, as we've talked about in episodes past, have been uh, subject to pretty strict uh, and unfairly strict in some cases protocols. I think everybody coming back is only going to help. I think the, that the Argos will, will ride that wave as more... I don't see more powerful, but yeah, like more powerful institutions fight for for better rules and and safer crowds. And you know, I'm not one to to quote um, you know Boris Johnson, but uh, you know, I do think that there is some legitimacy to to some of the questions he's raising about you know, in essence, look, if we are largely double vaxxed, if not now, when? If not outdoors, if not at outdoor sports with a largely vaccinated population, when when will we have crowds? Never? I think it's I think it's a fair question to ask that, you know, it doesn't mean we have to open up the entire world, but outdoor sports are safe and uh and they need to they need to adjust to that. 
We don't have exact dates on anything yet that's still being looked into, but from what I understand, the Blue Jays have received both provincial and municipal approval to return to Toronto. They're looking at July 30th, which be, would be the start of a 10-game homestand, and for which I'm sure they're hoping to have fans. So we'll see how quickly that progresses. TFC, we don't have a ton of detail on either. Um, they're, they're in a little bit more of a different situation. They're in a bit of a mess right now with everything that's going on with them but they've had their their traveling crew basically return home their their front office staff have come back to toronto and so they're hoping to be able to get the the team back here and playing out of toronto as soon as possible so we'll see how that develops but both of those developments i think can only be positive things for the toronto argonauts Well, that will just about do it for us today on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. As always, you can find all of our stuff on X'sandargos.com. And if you've got time, please rate, subscribe so our episodes show up right there on your phone and you don't miss a single one. And be sure to tell every Argonauts fan you know about us. Make sure they're listening. For JB, my name is Ben Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya.